Amen. Thank you, Oakley. Well, guys, welcome. We're glad to have you here. Uh, as Oakley said, we're going to kind of close out this series. If you have not been here in the last two weeks, um, basically, this is where we've been. We, when, when we started this ministry back in 2014, actually 2015, um, we, we tried to figure out, like, what, what are we trying to accomplish? Or, like, what are we actually trying to do? And, and I started thinking through, like, what, what do I not want to do? What do we not want this young adult ministry to become? And so I, I can't remember if I said this a couple weeks ago. In my mind, I think about it this way. I think there's, there's the, the cruise ship mentality of young adult ministry, like, hey, this is just church. We're going to do whatever we need to do. It's just here to, we're here to feel good about ourselves. We're here to just kind of relax, meet people, have some fun, and, and uh, slap a Jesus sticker on it. And I'm like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. I don't want to build a, a ministry that is a cruise ship mentality. But I also like, you know what, the, the battleship is the opposite end of that. And I'm like, that seems a little bit more accurate. Like we are on a mission and we are in this together against a enemy and it is going to be difficult, but it is a worthy and noble cause. But then I thought, you know what, it's not just a battleship. There's also these things called a mercy ship. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Have you heard of these? They are floating hospitals that go to poor parts of the world and they pull into uh, the, the docks and they just let people come on and they minister to them. They, they give them medical care and they teach them how to take care of themselves and then they go back. And I think we are probably best described as a battle mercy ship. That's the world that we want to live in. We don't want to just come every Tuesday night and say, hey, this is about me. I want to meet some people. I want to find some friends. I want to get, get weekend plans. It's so much more than that. And so this whole series is unpackaging, well, what, what is it? It's a place to belong. And if you were here two weeks ago, we talked about the fact that when it comes to belonging, the first thing is as a believer, you belong to the Lord. He has redeemed you with the blood of Christ. You are now his. He calls us his children. And then we also talked about the fact that we, we no longer actually belong to ourselves we don't belong to this world or ourselves. We, we are not our own people. I'm not my own man. I'm God's man. And so not only have I given up of myself and I belong to Christ, but I also belong to the family of God, the brothers and sisters who are also in the family of God. And so we belong to one another. And then last week, we just talked about this idea of being known, that God is actually the only one that fully knows you and truly loves you. He knows everything about you. You are known by him and fully and completely and truly loved by him. And the cross of Jesus Christ is proof of that. It's a wonderful proof of one, he knows us. So therefore the cross is necessary. There needs to be an atonement for our sin to be made right with the Lord. But he also says, because I know you, I will not just die for you, but I will raise again and I will bring you back to myself. And so the cross is not only the, the representation of our need for Jesus, but it's also the representation that he has made himself known to us and available to us. And then he continues in his word in 1 John 1, 9 and James 5, 16, now go be known to one another. Confess sin, live in freedom, walk in a way that's worthy of the gospel of Jesus. Do this together. So that brings us to tonight where we're gonna talk about becoming like Christ because at the end of the day, all the, the first two, belong and be known, they, those are just means to an end, okay? Community is not what we worship. Friendships is not what we worship. We are looking, that, that's a means to an end and the end is becoming like Christ. This is actually God's plan. So follow me here, it's, it's God's past plan, it's his current plan, and one day this plan will be our reality to become like Christ. And so we come together every Tuesday, we come together on Sunday mornings for worship in our Sunday school class and in church, we get together in small groups, not to feel good about ourselves, but to join with one another as we follow Jesus, becoming like him allowing ourselves and our friends to be God's representatives to this world. And so I wanna walk you through three quick things before we really get into the meat of tonight's message. 
I wanna show you the plan of God to, for us as believers to become like Christ. In Romans 8, 28, Paul writes this, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He predestines, he foreknew you, and he said, I'm gonna work all this stuff out for your good. That's a wonderful verse, but we have to recognize that God defines what is good, and what is good is that he is going to use this present life, this present situation, this present pain, this present suffering to form you into the image of Jesus. That this will refine you. And so it, from the beginning, it says, God foreknew and he also predestined. So this is the past plan. It's also his current plan. Look at 2 Corinthians 3.18. Paul writes this, and we all, Christians, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. What a wonderful, like this plus this plus this. We are currently through the Holy Spirit being formed into the image of Christ. That is his purpose for you as a believer. It was his past plan, it's his current plan, and it's also our future reality. First John 3, 2. John, the apostle John says, dear friends, now we are children of God, you belong to him, and what we will be has not yet been known. We are not where we will be. We don't know what that will be like, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. You see, this whole idea of becoming like Christ is not a gathering thing. It's not a crossing thing. This is a God's plan for your life thing. It was his plan before you were ever an idea in anyone's mind that as a believer, you would be conformed to the image of Christ that you currently, through the power of the Holy Spirit, are being conformed and shaped into the image of Jesus. And one day, when we see him and when we are with him, we, will, we shall be like him. And so we see this theme, and I'll just put it this way, Christ-likeness is the purpose of God for the people of God. Christ-likeness is the purpose of God in your life for the people of God. It's not for a bigger house, it's not for a be better retirement, it's not for a nicer car, it's not for a better situation. God's purpose in your life, in my life, is to use every situation to make us more like Jesus. So that as we live our lives, every breath we take reflects Jesus more and more and more and more. That's why Paul says we are his ambassadors. How can we be an ambassador if we are not increasingly, increasingly looking like Christ? Here's the thing. To become like Christ, you first must know Christ. And in order to know Christ, you must know his word and who the God of the Bible is. In order to know who the God of the Bible is, you must sit with the Lord. You must sit with him. Allow God's spirit to form you, to teach you and to guide you in all truth. If we are not in God's word, if we are not taking time to pray, it will be impossible for us to become more like Christ because we will become some self-created version of Jesus instead of the true Jesus of the Bible. And so here's what I want to do tonight. I want to talk about this idea that Christ's likeness is the purpose of God for the people of God. I want to look at five foundational ways we do this. Because we can't open the whole Bible and go verse by verse tonight. Well, I'm just going to give you five foundational things. The reason I picked these five foundational things is these are foundational things that we can build other things on. But it starts with these things. 
And so we're gonna look at Jesus tonight. And the first one is that we become like Christ first and foremost in his humility. We purpose, we endeavor to become like Jesus in his humility. Now, if, if you know me and I know you, can we just be honest for a minute? We don't wake up humble. We just don't. We are 100% looking out for number one. That's what we do. We wake up thinking, what do I want to do? Where do I want to go? What do I want to eat? What should I do tomorrow? What should I do next week? It's very, very much natural for us to be like, nah, it's about number one. But we get a wonderful picture of the humility of Christ in Philippians chapter two, verses one through seven. Listen to what Paul writes to the church in Philippi. Therefore, if, any, if, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, being a Christian, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in his spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and, and of one mind. Verse three, here we go. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each, to, each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. You see, here's the thing. Jesus is the son of God, the redeemer of all of humanity, and he chose to be humble. He chose to put our interests above his own. Rick Warren, pastor out in California, best-selling book, Purpose Driven Life. He wrote this, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Humility is thinking more of others. Now this is convicting. Humble people are focused on serving others they don't think of themselves. Ooh. I don't know about you. I wake up thinking about me. And I'll bet you wake up thinking about you. That's just, that's just what, the way we're wired. So thank God he has given us his Holy Spirit to renew and transform our minds and our hearts. This is that gift of dependence. Like, God, I need you. I need you to move so that I am not the most prideful, selfish person I know. God, you have to do it. We become like Jesus in his humility. He took his power and his privilege and his kingship and he humbled himself. Therefore, we can humble ourselves. He is king of kings and lord of lords and he chose to humble himself to the place of a servant. Guys, that's a, that is a worldview shift for us. That's a worldview shift. Because in, in, our, in our mindset, the world that we've grown up in, to become a servant means weak. It means we've lost. It means we're not as good as. But see, here's the thing, is Jesus was the completely integrated human. He knew who he was. His, he was completely secure in his identity as the son of God. And when his identity was secure, in who God said he was, it freed him up to serve. The reason we don't serve other people, the reason we don't live with humility is because we are trying to find our identity in something else other than who God says you are. That you're his child who is a citizen of his kingdom. And so Christ's likeness, that radical humility is the purpose of God for the people of God. Number two, we become like Christ in his servant mindset, right? When you're humble, it's a natural move to have a servant mindset. 
That word mindset just means the established set of attitudes held by someone. So here's a question we have to ask ourselves. What's your mindset? What have you determined to be the attitude of your heart and your mind in your life? What is your mindset? Do you ever think about this? I don't think I do very often. I don't think, what is my mind set on? And usually, it's gonna be comfort, convenience, um, what people think of me, make sure that's good, right? Like, my mind is set on things that are not what Christ's mind was set on. So again, it brings me to a place of dependence. Holy Spirit, change the way my mind works. Help me see people the way you see them so that I may be free to serve them. In John 13, three, four, and five, it says, Jesus knew. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. This is, this is the beginning of the Last Supper, by the way. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power so that he had come from God and that he was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus, again, used his position of power. God had given him power over all things. And he used his power to serve. Not for his advantage, but to serve. Isn't that just an upside down worldview? Like you look at our world today, somebody gets a little bit of power, look out. You probably work with someone like that, don't you? They get a little bit of power at work and it's like, oh, look out. I always, this is probably gonna show my age, maybe you guys are with me, but I remember the, the show The Office. And there's a character named Dwight Schrute. And he gets a little bit of power. And what does he do? He destroys the office, fires a gun in there. It just goes bad quickly. Right? That's humanity. But Jesus had all things put under his power. And he got down on his knees and washed the disciples' feet. That was the move. So what's our move as we become like Christ? We seek out ways to serve the way Christ served us. Christ's likeness, having a servant servant mindset is the purpose of God for the people of God. Number three, we purpose to become like Christ in his sacrificial love of others. His sacrificial love of others. In Ephesians 5, 2, Paul writes this, follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, your identity, this is who you are, therefore walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You see, our world's view of love is not the the love of Christ. Our world's view of love is 1,000% selfish. Jesus loves sacrificially. I love Ephesians 5, 2. It says, follow God's example. This is God's example because Jesus is a perfect image of God. He says, therefore, as children of God, as my family, love as Christ has loved you. And it's self-sacrificial. John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus says this to his disciples at the same Last Supper, A new command I give you, love one another. Not the way you feel like it, not the way you think best. He says, love one another as I have loved you. We imitate, we become like Christ in the way we love one another. He says, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And so we belong to each other. We're a faith family. And what does Jesus say? Love one another with a self-sacrificial love that puts someone else's interests as the primary interest. Can we th- can you even fathom a community like that? Where you are so free to love people because you are experiencing and have confidence that other people are gonna love and care for you well. 
You don't have to worry about someone talking to you because you know you got people that love you. And so you can be free to go serve and care for and pray for and meet with and encourage other people because you know without a shadow of a doubt someone else will do that for you. But the reason we hold back is because we're not sure anyone will do that for us. But Jesus says, love as I have loved you. We give up our insecurities for the sake of someone else. We get past our own fears for the sake of someone else. We allow ourselves to be inconvenienced oh, for the sake of someone else. You see, Christ's likeness, that self-sacrificial love, is the purpose of God for the people of God. Number four, we purpose to become like Christ in his patient endurance. His patient endurance. You know, here's why we say this, is because life is just harder than we think. Life is hard. Life is not what we think. It's not what we anticipate. Stuff happens all the time to you, to people you know, people that you are just tangentially acquainted with, people on the news, and we're like, man, life is hard. Jesus said in John 16, in this world you will have trouble. We kicked this, we kicked 2024 off with that series, Take Heart. Because Jesus told us, in this life you will have difficulty. But Jesus says, take heart for I have overcome the world. And so just as Jesus, like think about it, we, we, we serve and worship a savior that, that suffered, that was spit on, that was misunderstood, that was poorly represented. This is our savior. And so why would we expect to never be spit on or disagreed with or misunderstood or cast out or, or pushed out? That will happen because it happened to Jesus. But he had this, patience, this patient endurance. Why? Because he knew why he was here. And he knew who he was. His identity was secure. His purpose was secure. And so therefore, he could handle it. He could take the rejection. He could take the spitting. He could take the misunderstanding. As Christians, we need more grit. We just do. We need more grit. The kind of grit that we see Jesus live out day after day after day in the Gospels. That man had grit because he knew who he was. He was God's son, who is sent on a noble and eternal mission. And so therefore, he was able to withstand the difficulty. In Philippians 1, 27, Paul writes this, whatever happens, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of who? Christ. Meaning, whatever happens, we live in a way that would honor the way Jesus would live. And Jesus lived with grit. He says, then, whether I come and see you, Paul says, or I only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm. I love this unifying statement. You stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. We will have opposition. Expect it, celebrate it, let it encourage you that you are walking the straight and narrow. If you are not facing opposition, you gotta ask, where are you walking? And then he says, this, I love this, this is a sign to the opposition that they will be destroyed. But you will be saved by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Suffering is a part of the Christian life. I don't wanna ever preach a gospel that says it is gonna be easy, it is gonna be a cakewalk, there's never any speed bumps. There are speed bumps. Jesus told us there would be speed bumps. There will be cliffs, there'll be collisions. In this world, you will have trouble, said Jesus. So can we just get a different mindset 
that when we inevitably face suffering, when we inevitably face opposition, that we can take courage that God is with you and he will work this out, even this suffering, for your good and it will conform you to the image of Christ. Christ's likeness, that patient endurance, is the purpose of God for the people of God. And then lastly, to become, we purpose to become like Christ in his mission. We become like Christ in his mission. Gathering, this could not be, this is maybe the easiest point that I could ever make in a message but it is the single most difficult part of our faith, I believe, that we would share in Christ's mission. Jesus says it so plainly, it is, it is impossible to misunderstand this. In Luke 19, 10, referring to himself, Jesus, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That is the mission. Whether we are a battleship or a mercy ship, we are here to share in the mission of Jesus. And Jesus said, this is not my words, this is not, this is Jesus, the one we claim to follow, said, I have come to seek and save the lost. He refers to it again in John 17. John 17, by the way, is a wonderful prayer that Jesus prays between just him and the Lord, just him and dad. And you know who he's praying for? You. John 17 is Jesus' prayer for us. Go read it tonight. Jesus says this, Father, as you sent me into this world, now I have sent them into the world. John 20, just a couple verses later. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Are we, are we catching the theme here? Jesus has a mission. He has redeemed us. And now we belong to him and he is now sending us on the same mission. The most famous verse, Matthew 28, verse 18. Then Jesus came to the disciples and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore... Because he has authority, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus came to redeem his people and then send his people out as agents of redemption. What a beautiful story. What a beautiful purpose and picture what God has for you and what God has for me and what God has for your children and what God has for your grandchildren one day is that he has sent Jesus to the cross to redeem you to himself and now he says, now you go and be an agent of redemption. Not an agent for yourself, not an agent for your own glory, be an agent for Jesus. You represent Christ, gathering. If you are a Christian, if you have given your life to Christ, meaning you've surrendered authority of your life to the kingship of Jesus, this is our mission, to seek and save the lost. I love, my new favorite verse is Acts 10, 38. It is so cool. <laughs> it's Peter telling Gentiles, he's reminding them of who Jesus was. Listen to the words of how Peter describes the mission of Jesus. And can, can we just be honest for a second? Can we listen to these words with a, a mirror of reflection to say, is this my life? Is this the mission that I am on? Listen to these words. This is fantastic. He says, and you, and how, you know how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the tyranny of the devil because God was with him. What's he doing with the power of the Holy Spirit? 
He's doing good. And he's healing people from the tyranny of the devil. God, that convicts me. That's Jesus' mission. That's how Peter described his mission. So as I was preparing this message, I was feeling convicted that my mission often is not that. It's a myriad of other things. It's fun experiences. It's to take a good nap, right? Like, it's just comfort. It's convenience. It's chasing people's approval. It's chasing a dollar amount. That's, that's what our mission drifts into when we lose sight of who Jesus is and what he was about. He came to redeem you. Check. Accomplished on the cross 2,000 years ago. And now as a Christian, he sends us out as agents of redemption. So here's the, the questions. Here's the questions that came to me that I want to invite you into my conviction, okay? When was the last time you shared the gospel with someone? Think about it. When was the last time you even thought about sharing the gospel with someone? This is our mission because this was the mission of Jesus. Let me pull it back one more. When was the last time I, I even prayed for the salvation of someone I know? If we are truly going to be followers of Jesus, if we are going to endeavor and purpose to become like Christ, then we cannot ignore the sole reason Jesus came. We can love people with humility. We can serve people with love. We can self-sacrificially love people and serve them. We can even suffer with it a little bit. But if we are not on the mission of Jesus, then it's all for naught. I'm not trying to guilt you tonight at all. But what I'm trying to do here is to bring to light the mission of Jesus and then ask an honest and truthful question, are we on mission? Four weeks ago when we were in this room, we had our worship and prayer night. The thing that encouraged me the most is I know you guys could say yes to these questions. Because three quarters of the room stood up when I said, how many in here know of a name of someone that you know that doesn't know Jesus? And three, three quarters of you stood up. And we prayed for those people. And so I'm, that, man, that, nothing encouraged me more than that. Worship's awesome, but to see that God has put a person on your heart and in your target, that's the mission of Jesus. We cannot just be fans of Jesus, we need to be followers of Jesus. Because Christ's likeness looks like being on mission, the same mission that Christ was on. That is the purpose of God for the people of God. So in review, we, we purpose ourselves to follow Jesus by becoming like him in humility, serving, loving one another self-sacrificially, suffering with and for him, and then being on mission with him. I wonder if you came with a friend tonight or a small group, if you might pull this list out the next time you get together and say, how are we doing? as a friend group, as a small group, as what, what, how are we doing in following Jesus? How's our humility? How's our grit? How's our mission? Like, how, let's have these conversations. This is what we're here for, to belong to Christ and to one another, to be known by God and one another, and to become like Christ alongside one another. That's why we meet every Tuesday night. And so what do we do with this? Same as the last two weeks. The first one is we believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Second, we stay in the body of Christ even, even when other believers don't represent Christ well. We stay in. We belong to one another. And then we lean in to the humility of Christ, the service of Christ, the suffering of Christ, 
the mission of Christ and the love of Christ. We lean into those things. And then we end with mission. We welcome people in. We say, come and see. Jesus in all four gospels, all four gospels, I think it's 13 or 15 times Jesus says, follow me. Leave what you have and follow me. What a wonderful invitation. We took, we, we heard that invitation at some point. Who are you welcoming in? Who are you praying for that they would accept Christ and come into the family of God? To not just have hope for today, but hope for eternity. Who are we welcoming in? Who's in the crosshairs of your heart? Who has God placed you specifically around that you might be the ambassador of Christ to them? Because I have no interest in building a platform or a room full of people with a cruise ship mentality. If we're gonna come together, let's come together with a mission and let that mission be the same mission Jesus was on to love one another the way he has loved us and to seek and save the lost in this city. And whatever city you end up going to, that's who you are. You are a child of God if you are a Christian. You have been welcomed into the family. So let's get busy of God's business instead of our comfort and convenience. And we can expect the suffering. It's okay. Christ suffered immeasurably more than we could. We don't ask God to align his view to our view. We align our view to his and our mission to his and our definition of love to his definition of love. Are you following me? Does that make sense? So that's why the gathering exists. Truthfully, that's why every church exists. We just saw a need for young adults to be, have a place to gather, that we could encourage one another and live this out together because it is hard. It is not a cakewalk, it is not a cruise ship. So I'm gonna leave the believe, the stay, the lean, and the welcome on the screen for our 126. Actually, I take it back. Let's go back to the slide, the review. Humility, serving, loving, suffering, and being on a mission. Can we go back to that slide? This is gonna be our 120 seconds. Would you go before the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit, which one, which one, Holy Spirit, do you want me to step into tonight, this, tomorrow, this week? Which one of those needs to be sharpened in my life? Which one do I need to jump on board with reckless abandon because I've been holding back? And just let the Holy Spirit speak to you because you know you better than I know you, and the Holy Spirit knows you better than you know you. So let's just go before him. And then when we're done, I'm gonna pray, and we're gonna go through our time of communion again. But we'll give you two minutes just to prayerfully talk to the Lord about becoming like Christ. And what does that look for you, like for you in this season?